Hey, it's uh, Marco Catanio again. Um, we're going to chat about the high-level process model and how it all works. And we're also going to look at some characteristics of processes. Okay, let's then look at our process. I think we've already agreed in a previous topic that a process can be seen as a big black box, or in this scenario a big red box, where something comes in and something goes out. But before we can actually start to like look within the process box, we first need to establish a, a different layer, the so-called process control layer. So what's this process control level all about? Again, it's another box, the process control box. And firstly, we have to set like uh, some objectives. So uh, what are we trying to achieve? Why are we actually doing the process? What do we want to get out of it? Okay, because if you aim for nothing, that's what you will get. So you have to set some smart objectives. Also, you need to assign ownership. You want to make someone like end accountable for the process, set like the process owner. And typically we're talking about like one captain on a ship. Uh, you also need to think about setting a policy. Uh, a policy for me is like a document that actually outlines the boundaries. It, it, it's like as a guidance on how you're going to work within your process environment. Uh, this is what we're allowed to do, and this is what we aren't allowed to do. For example, if you think of like a process like change management. Think about documentation. Because documentation makes your process like more transferable, uh, better to measure, better to follow. Because if you can actually write down what you're doing, then you actually understand your own process. If you can't write down your own process, I think then your processes are currently chaos. And last but not least, we need feedback. We need to actively look for feedback to actually to be able to like improve our own processes. So actively look for like comp uh, complaints, uh, compliments, and also like the metrics and the measurements. Okay, so we've got the process control layer in place. Now it's time to drill down into the actual process. So let's have a look what happens within a process. Hey, remember the definition of a process? It's like a set of related activities you perform to achieve something. So surely we're talking about activities as part of the process. Now, if you look at like the what and the when and the who is actually performing all those activities, we're actually talking about procedures. So a procedure is typically a document that outlines a number of activities in sequence and also describes who's actually performing them. If you look at like a specific activity or a, a part of a specific activity and you actually describe in detail how things are going to work, then we're talking about the work instruction. So a work instruction is about the how you're doing activities. A role, a role is nothing more and nothing less than a set of activities you actually assign to someone. Uh, you make someone responsible to perform uh, one or more activities. So you talk about role descriptions, so it's clear to you who's doing what. Metrics allow you to actually measure the performance, the efficiency slash effectiveness of your own process. Because if you don't know what you're doing, and if you don't know how well you're doing it, then how the heck will you be able to actually improve your processes? So improvements are a vital part of each process environment. Uh, whatever I do today, I can hopefully do it a little bit better tomorrow. Uh, you probably know the saying, uh, the English saying, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Well, sorry, that is not service management. If it ain't broken, feel free to improve it if it's going to be cost effective for you. So we're almost there. We've got the process control layer in place. We've got the actual process in place. What else do we need? Well, we need some process enablers. Being what? Well, being the resources, like the technology, the applications, and probably budget as well. And we need some capabilities. We need like management skills, we need leadership, we need, again, we need people with the right, the right capabilities, the right abilities to do things. So that's the full-blown process model. Last but not least, something will trigger the process. So typically, uh, if I have like an, if, if a user calls the service desk with an incident, that will trigger the whole incident management process. If someone submits a request for change into the change management process, that will trigger the change management process. So each process typically has a trigger or one or more triggers. And by the way, uh, last but not least, if you think of outputs, outputs in the form of like metrics uh, and reports, of course, all those outputs can also be used to provide feedback to the control level so they, they can actually make the right decisions. Okay, Based upon information, you can then make actually the proper decisions. That's the full-blown, like, high-level process model that ITIL uses.
So here you find some process characteristics. Now, first of all, processes should be measurable. Yeah? Whatever you do within the process, it, I think you should be able to measure it somehow in some shape or form. Because if you can't measure it, it's probably not even worthwhile doing. Also, processes deliver specific results. Uh, you've got something like an output. Uh, it may be a car, it may be a service, it may be a product. Something comes out of that process box. Also, processes have customers. So it says here, processes deliver results, uh, the previous topic, uh, to customers, stakeholders, and other processes. Processes also like communicate with each other. At the output of one process, well, the customer may actually be another process. The output of incident management may also be used, for example, by the process problem management. And the output of problem management may also be used by the process, for example, change management. So all these processes also like interface with each other. And last but not least, it says here processes also respond to a specific event. They all have a trigger. It's like they've got a button. On this big, big box, you find like an on-off button. And something needs to press the on button to make everything happen in that process box. And we've talked about incidents and problems and changes uh, being triggers, triggering the process boxes. Okay, let's do another practice what you preach. Uh, hopefully this is going to be a funny one. Uh, it's all about understanding a process. I'm going to ask you to describe the process of preparing a bacon and eggs breakfast. So describe the process control components like objectives and owner. Describe the actual process itself. What are the inputs? What are the activities? What are the outputs? And also describe the process enablers. Hey, have fun. Here's another simple question. Uh, the question is, which one of the following statements is incorrect? Answer A, processes must be automated. Answer B, processes should be measurable. Answer C, processes create results. And answer D, processes have one or more specific triggers. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about the answer. Okay, hopefully you've picked one. The right answer is, of course, answer A. Uh, processes must be automated. No, not necessarily. Okay, a lot of processes will be manual, uh, and some processes will be like partly manual and partly automated. So answer A is actually the incorrect answer. So we've just closed the module Service Management as a Practice, uh, which consists of like five topics. The next module is called the Service Lifecycle, and we'll start off with describing the service lifecycle model, its structure, the scope of it, the components and interfaces. I would say live long and prosper. I'll see you back in the next module. Ciao.